Welcome to the fourth part of the product line lecture. Today we are going to learn about feature modeling and what this has to do with trees such as this one. My name is Elias Küter and I'm your guest lecturer for today. And I've created these slides with Thomas Thun and Thierry Pira. So, in the first part of the lecture, we learned about what the motivation is for introducing product lines and also how we can implement product lines with runtime constructs such as if then else or also how we can implement variability with compile time, such as uh, cloning and owning software products. And starting with this week, we are going to talk about what is actually a feature, how do features depend on each other, and how can we leverage this for implementing features in different ways, and how does this also tie into the development process of product lines. And this time we are going to talk about what is a feature model? Why do we need this? How can we also express configurations in other languages maybe? And how can we transform features from different uh, languages into other languages and what is the benefit of this? And then finally, we're going to analyze feature models and build a small configurator or at least study how those configurators can be built to um, derive valid products automatically. Then let's get started. A small recap, what is a software product line? So a software product line is essentially a set of software intensive systems, so a set of products that share a common managed set of features. These features do not have to occur in all products, but they are shared by all products. And the features are targeted at a specific market segment or mission, which we also call domain. And the idea is ideally that we can develop a software product line from a common set of core assets, for example, source code, in a prescribed way, for example, automatic generation with some kind of implementation technique. One product in a product line is then specified by a valid feature selection, so a subset of the features of the product line. Such a subset, such a configuration, can be valid, but only if it fulfills all feature dependencies. Now I've used the word feature a lot, what is it? It's a characteristic or end-user visible behavior of a software system, according to Apple et al., although there are many other definitions and this definition is also very open. At the example of the printer or paper processor, as it's called by the XKCD, um, we can see there are a lot of features. For example, we can print, we can copy fax, staple, fold origami and airplanes and whatsoever. One question we can ask is, do we really need all these features? Do we need to fold origami flowers with a printer? Another question which we might ask is how do these features relate to each other? For example, stapling some printouts does not really make sense if we don't print anything. So probably this feature is going to be enabled together with this feature. But printing without stapling might be all right. So features have dependencies. And another example for these dependencies from real life, taken actually from when I went to the zoo, is uh, this waffle product line if you if you want um, it's um, there are different configurations so you can get a waffle with sugar for three euros fifty and you can also get a waffle with cream and one with cherries and cherries and cream some combinations and if you have a close look there's also a children's waffle with uh, some kind of Nutella and uh, colored crumbs. There are some example configurations here on the, yeah, the, on the counter. And uh, you can order different configurations, for example, the one with sugar, the one with cherries. And interestingly, you also get, uh, when you order cherries, you get this plate and you also get this fork. And this is already really nice. So you can order different waffles and get some configurations. However, there are some slight problems. So, for example, in this configuration, we got a plate and a fork, and in this one, we didn't get a fork, probably because you don't need it, because uh, there's no cherries involved. But these limitations seem kind of arbitrary. They are not documented over here in, in this list of configurations. And also, for example, the, the children, they get special treatment. So yeah, only the children can get these uh, colored crumbs, and if I want to get crumbs, I can't. So the order process is maybe also unfair. It's not well documented. And also it's a little bit unclear what exactly I'm paying for. So um, if you have a look at the prices and how these prices combine to get the final price, so what you're investing is also maybe unclear. And in this lecture, we're trying to show you how we can 
uh, also in this example, model and configure features and also their dependencies. How can we store such uh, features and their dependencies and communicate them to other people so that everyone knows what to expect? And also, how can we maybe automatically analyze and understand these kinds of configurations and uh, the complexities uh, of the involved dependencies? So one thing we have to think about is what is actually a configuration and especially what makes a valid configuration. And uh, this is a little bit mathematical, but uh, the, the mathematics help us to actually know what's going on and I'm going to explain every step. So the basic idea of a configuration over a set of features is that we have some kind of selection of features and dually we also have some kind of deselection. So we can say a pair of selected and deselected features makes a configuration and we cannot select and deselect a feature so both sets have to be disjoined. Yeah, we can, for example, consider this feature set F here. There's a configurable database um, and a few features for doing something in the database, for example, reading data and setting data and deleting data. And some databases may also have support for transactions. Others don't. For example, if you consider SQLite, it doesn't have transaction support. And most databases run on some kind of operating system. In this case, maybe Windows or maybe Linux. And in the following, I'm going to abbreviate these feature names with their first letter, for example, C for configurable database. And uh, now we can list some kind of configurations. And I'm also always going to use this kind of pair notation um, if the deselected, um, the deselected features are interesting. And here they are, for example, we have selected configurable database with read support so we can get stuff and it runs on Windows. No, a read-only database on Windows, and all other features are in the second set of the pair, so they are deselected. So we can't write to the database, we can't delete, we don't have any transactions, and it doesn't run on Linux. Now we can have some more explanations about what configurations are. A configuration can be complete if every feature occurs in, uh, is selected or deselected, basically. And we can also have partial configurations. Here are some examples for partial configurations. For example, here we have a configurable database which is read-only probably because, yeah, because put and delete are deselected, but we don't know anything yet about the operating system and whether it understands transactions. And also this funny looking thing uh, is two empty sets. So no features have been selected yet and no features have been deselected either. So it's a completely open configuration, you might say. And the most interesting thing is to uh, think about whether a configuration is actually valid. So it, it's valid if it kind of makes sense in the domain. And we're going to talk about in more detail what this means. And of course, if we're not interested in the deselected features, we might only write the selected features. So maybe for, for this configuration, we could only write CGW to refer to the entire configuration and just ignore the deselected ones because the configuration is complete. Um, I've now explained the first example, and this kind of makes sense, a read-only database on Windows, but we can also consider some other examples. For example, we might just select almost every feature, and then we get a fully functional database, in this case on Linux, because we only selected almost every feature. Windows was deselected still. But we can also have some configurations which don't make sense. For example, in this configuration, there is no operating system selected. Windows and Linux have explicitly been deselected. And if you think about it, a database system that does not run on any operating system probably doesn't make much sense. At least in our example, it doesn't. So this configuration, it would be invalid. And also other things uh, may occur. So here we have um, selected the transactions feature. It's on the left side, uh, in the left set. But we didn't select any, read, uh, any writing features. So um, writing to the database with put was disabled and deleting from the database with delete was also disabled. And if you think about databases, transactions only really make much sense if you have some kind of means of writing to a database. So having this kind of configuration, it might work, sure, but it's a little useless to have transactions in this kind of database. So 
probably this should be an invalid configuration. Okay, so now we uh, I've uh, said several times now that a configuration can be valid if it makes sense. Of course, this is not precise and we have to have some way of making this more precise. Um, one kind of thing you could do is just uh, list the features and their, uh, their dependencies with natural language. In this case, uh, we can have a description of the database in English and I'll give you a few seconds to read it. Okay, so basically this definition or this uh, this string describes what I've already um, said verbally, but it has uh, the, the advantage that it's now documented and people can read it and understand it. And for the most part, it's also fine, right? So uh, each feature is mentioned, uh, it's uh, black here emphasized, and also their dependencies. For example, um, that only one operating system is um, is selected and exactly one is selected. So this is an informal description and a configuration is now valid if it conforms to the description. Okay. However, of course, this might be ambiguous at some time, in some instances and also it's not machine readable. So uh, also maybe even not human readable if you have tens of th uh, pages of such specifications it's going to be hard to find exactly the kind of um, dependency that you want. So maybe natural language is not always the best solution for specifying valid configurations. A completely opposite approach would be to just take a configuration map. What is a configuration map? I show it at the example. It's just a list of all valid configurations. Basically, you can also say a table or matrix or something like that. Yeah, we can just uh, take the feature set and think about, okay, does the configuration configurable database get and Windows make sense? And if it makes sense, we put it on the list. So mathematically, a configuration map over a set of features would be um, se yeah, a, set, a subset of all possible configurations, right? So the possible configurations would be the power set of the feature set. So every subset of features and then we just uh, take a kind of slice of the set and um, all others are invalid. And a configuration is then valid if it occurs in this configuration map or in this matrix. And this kind of element operator obviously is well defined. So this is really precise. However, we have the kind of uh, opposite problem to before. This is not really human readable anymore. Try to understand that transactions implies put and or delete, you won't be able to understand it based on this configuration map. That is one problem. The other problem is obviously that this is a really redundant way of specifying things and might be explode in size. So in this example, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven features. So if you consider each feature as independent from all other features, you might enable or disable config DB. So you have two possibilities for this feature. You also have two possibilities for this one and this one and this one. So you get two times two times two to the seven, basically as the potential number of configurations. Two to the seven, that would be, I think, 128. And now in here we only have uh, about 20 configurations. So we didn't list all of them because not all of them are valid. But in the worst case, we just get an exponential number of configurations. And usually for large product lines, we also do get this kind of large number of configurations. And it's hard to even list all of these configurations and uh, even harder to, to do anything meaningful with it. Yeah, what you see in practice usually amounts to something like this. Uh, this is an Excel sheet and it's basically what I've shown you before. It's the configuration matrix or map. Uh, as a table. So we have one column for each feature and an X means that uh, the, the feature occurs in this product and each row is one product. And obviously this is not a very structured way to do things, but 
it can be done and in the industry it's also actually done because uh, Excel is there, everyone understands the tool and it's also, uh, it shouldn't be underestimated as a, as a tool for doing these kinds of things. But still, we might ask, is there no better, re uh, no better way to do this? And there actually is. So we are introducing feature models now and uh, this is a, an idea which is uh, already over 30 years old, going back to this technical report and it's a kind of visualization, a diagram like this, with um, different kinds of aspects to it. So a feature model is uh, first and foremost a hierarchy of features. So we have this kind of tree and in this tree each node is one feature and how the nodes are connected, the edges, describe some relationships between these features. And each feature model consists of two parts. We have this tree thing and also below the tree we have some, cron uh, some constraints and dependencies between features are both modeled by the actual graphical tree and also by the constraints below. In the constraints below we are talking about those uh, in a minute uh, but uh, let's start with the tree. Each feature in the tree can have a uh, color so if you have a look at it some are a little, uh, more blue and some are more white so API and OS are white and this means in this context that they are abstract and all others are concrete and we use this um, this decision uh, between abstract and concrete to say whether a feature has an actual implementation artifact or whether it only is used to group features for example this api feature is only used to group get put and delete and to structure the feature model so it's abstract but get, put and delete actually have code behind them if you look into some implementation, which we won't do today, but probably they have some code and this is why they are concrete. But in the end, you can choose these colors how you like. Um, more importantly, we have also some notation for describing relationships between features. For example, here we have these circuits above each feature. And the circuits say whether the feature has to be selected or does not have to be selected. Or to be more precise, an empty circle means that the feature is optional, so transactions can be chosen if its parent is selected, but does not have to be. While a mandatory feature has to be chosen if its parent is selected, and vice versa. So API cannot be deselected ever. It also makes sense because every database has to be an API, has to have an api and the operating system is the same it can also never be deselected it is mandatory so we have to select an operating system and we also have some other constructs for example staying here at the operating system there is this uh, curious arc thing uh, which denotes an alternative group if you look into the legend alternative group just means exactly one of the features in this group has to be selected so in this case if OS is selected, which it is because it's mandatory, you select either Windows or Linux. You cannot select neither and you cannot select both. That is what, what this arc means. We also have another kind of group, which is this arc, which is filled with, uh, with gray. This is an OR group. It works pretty similarly, but it is not possible to, um, it is possible to select several features and any combination of features in fact but you have to select at least one so from get put and delete you have to select at least one at least get or maybe put or delete but not none if api is selected which is always uh, the case because it's mandatory right so as a recap the alternative group here means you have to select either windows or linux the OR group here means you have to select get or put or delete or any other combination of them, but not none. The empty circle means transactions is optional. The filled out circle means that API and OS are mandatory. So what about the root? The, the feature at the top of the tree is called the root feature. This one has to always be selected. So we cannot uh, have a database without this kind of code. And basically, in the end, this feature is representative of the base code of the product. So the code which is always included for configurable databases. And one final thing which we had in the natural language example before is that transactions only work if 
we are in a writable database and this is expressed as a cross tree constraint below the feature model. So uh, if transactions is selected, we have to select put or delete. And you might notice that this is a propositional formula and uh, we can use these kinds of formulas to specify all kinds of dependencies. So the root feature is always required and uh, each feature requires its parent. Optional features can be freely selected when its parent is selected. Mandatory features are always required. All groups and alternative groups are uh, described here again, if you want to read it. And the cross tree constraints are logical formulas and for a configuration to be valid, each cross constraint also has to be satisfied. Okay, this was a lot of a lot of content and we can now have a look at an example. So this is the configurable database again, and we're now going to step over a configuration and have a look at whether this configuration is actually valid or it's not valid. So this example, we already had this before. It was the read-only database on Windows. It had a configura configurable database, so the root feature was selected, so it's green here. The API and OS features are also selected, so both are also green here. Um, and we also always have on the left side the, the selected features in green and the deselected features in red. Transactions put delete and Linux are in red, so they are deselected. Is this valid? Yes, of course, because the root feature is selected. API and OS are also selected, as they have to be. And the constraints here, the get feature is selected, so the or group is satisfied. At least one has to be selected, and it is. And the constraint here is also satisfied, so Windows is selected and Linux is deselected, so either one of them is selected, so that's okay. And also we don't have transactions, it's deselected, so the constraint here is vacuous. We don't have to care about this because the left side is false. Another example would be the fully functional database on Linux. So the only feature not selected here is the Windows feature. And uh, if you can see here, everything is still fine. So Windows is deselected. It also has to be deselected. If it were selected, uh, this alternative group would not work anymore, but it's okay. Maybe more interestingly here, we have no operating system. Windows and Linux are both deselected and this violates this tree constraint with the alternative group. And also, this uh, configuration would also be invalid. If you have a look, um, transactions is selected, so it's green here, but neither put nor delete is selected. However, if transactions is selected, put or delete has to be selected. So this cross tree constraint here is violated now. Okay, so we now have a way to specify valid configurations within feature models and um, we can apply this onto any domain, basically. We don't have to do this for software product nice. We can also maybe take the waffle example from before and put this into a feature model. And it could uh, look something like this. So waffle might be the, the root feature and it's also not abstract. It's concrete because we have something concrete. We have the actual waffle and um, it always has to be selected. So uh, purchasing a waffle without actually having a waffle doesn't make sense. But um, maybe the topping uh, is optional. So, for example, we could maybe uh, not have any topping for a waffle. Um, and there are different kinds of topics, for example, sugar, cream, cherries, Nutella, crumbles. And maybe there are different kinds of crumbles, chocolate and colored crumbles. And here it's modeled like uh, in a way that you cannot combine chocolate and colored crumbles. You have to choose one. And if you choose a topping, you have to choose at least one, which uh, this or group means but it's optional, empty circle. However, however, the accessories are not optional. You always get the plate. You may get a fork, so it's optional. And if you get a fork, it's either plastic or wood. And also the customer plays a role. Of course, the customer is not part of the product, so it's abstract here. And the customer is either an adult or a child. And there are some cross constraints below this model. For example, in the example in the zoo, which I showed before, there was always sugar, so actually sugar was always selected, so we can uh, write it down like this. And if you got cherries, you automatically got, got a sugar and a fork. And if you wanted Nutella or crumbles, you had to be a child, it was not possible in any other way. And if you got a fork, 
you have to be an adult because maybe if you have a fork, accidents can happen and uh, it's not safe for children. These might, might be some constraints you have. And if you take a close look at this, um, there are also some other implications. For example, suppose you want cherries and then you have to have sugar, sugar and you also have to get a fork. But if you want to have a fork, uh, you have to be an adult and you cannot be an adult if you are a child. So in other way, in other words, as a child, you cannot get cherries with this feature model. It's not that obvious if you just look at the constraints. And we're going to learn about how to de uh, develop and detect these kinds of um, conditions automatically. And also what you can uh, learn from this example is uh, that there are also other ways to use these kinds of constructs. So abstract and concrete features, you can assign them how you want, how you would like to. Usually we use concrete features to model features that actually have code. You can use these groups, these OR groups and alternative group groups, anywhere you want. And also some important thing which is uh, always uh, often done wrong is that below some group you cannot have optional or mandatory markers. So there are no circles beneath a group and vice versa. If you have no group, such as here, there are circles. So we only use these circuits if there is no group above the, above the feature. Okay, so we've now learned the syntax and also the semantics, so the meaning of feature models and uh, maybe uh, how we can use them on some examples. So what is the, are the advantages and disadvantages of this concept? So um, first of all, it helps us making tested knowledge explicit. What does it mean? Um, I have a quote and give you some time to read it. So in this example, we saw that there was some kind of product, we don't need to know uh, the details, where the same functionality was actually implemented twice within the same project. And they didn't realize that it was developed twice because the features were not communicated clearly. There was no kind of feature model, maybe uh, not even requirements documents or these requirements documents had some overlap. Uh, we don't really know, but having a feature model and having uh, some kind of representation of features and also their dependencies helps us making this implicit knowledge, which is not known, so it's tacit knowledge, making this explicit. This is uh, some kind of uh, managing perspective, but also we can have a look at the automating perspective. And uh, actually for these feature models, which we discussed, there's a lot of tool support um, developed over the last 20 years. For example, there's the open source feature IDE and also some commercial product like Gears or Pure Variants and uh, many research prototypes which take these models and extract some kind of interesting information which can make the lives of product line engineers much more easier. So this is kind of good. However, there's also a flip side to the coin or some challenges which you have to consider. First of all, there's always the issue of scoping. So um, if you remember the Eierliegende Wollmilchsau from the first lecture, this animal which can do basically anything you ask it to, the question is, is it already uh, always necessary to have, have all these features in your product line? Do we need the printer that uh, folds origami? Do we need um, the, the forks uh, for the waffles or, or not? So um, this is not an easy question to answer in every case. And um, also interestingly, how do features actually interact and, and how do features depend on each other? So um, in this example, for example, I basically just gave you the dependencies, but in reality, you have to yeah, think about them really hard and not always, uh, it's not always obvious how features uh, interact with each other. And also, as every new technology, as every new concept, it requires uh, several things like infrastructure in your organization. It uh, requires maybe consulting, um, for example, something that the, uh, the company that develops this product does is consulting for product line projects. And also training, like 
a product line lecture, for example. Yeah. So uh, probably you didn't know about feature models before listening to this lecture. It's not a complex uh, concept, but it has to be taught some in some way. Okay, so in this part of the lecture, you learned about features, how features can depend on other features, also recursively, of course, and what a configuration is and how configurations can be expressed in several ways. One of these ways is feature models, which are diagrams con uh, consisting of a tree of features and below of the tree there are cross tree constraints. And there are different kinds of relationships modeled in such a feature model. For example, we have optional features, we have mandatory features and some kinds of groups or groups and alternative groups. You can also read up on feature modeling, for example, in the book from Apple et al. and also from, uh, in some papers of our colleagues. And finally, um, we encourage you to actually do this practice um, exercise because it helps you to recap how feature models work, how the syntax works, so how these diagrams look like, and also how the semantics work, so um, how uh, features actually depend on each other. So the task would be that you sketch a feature model with these six features, A, B, C, D, E, F, and it should only have five valid configurations. And you can do this with some tool support, but maybe first do it with pen and paper to actually learn how these models should look like. And if that's available to you, you can also discuss in groups whether your feature models are actually correct and maybe give each other some tips and, and corrections and whether they actually also specify these configurations and no more and also no less. So thank you for listening. See you in the next lecture.